Hello, everyone. Welcome to my podcast and my YouTube channel again. Here we are, a hundred episodes. And on the other side here of my Zoom screen, I have a podcaster because I decided that on my hundred episode, I was going to treat myself. And as a guest, I have Kirk Honda, Dr. Kirk Honda with us. He is my favorite podcaster clinician like me were colleagues in that regard too and I it's it's a podcast that I found I don't know four or five years ago because you've been doing this forever when nobody knew about podcasts right mm -hmm. but it it is really a podcast that I recommend especially if you become a Patreon <laughs> because he has these wonderful deep dives and I listen to them. They have one and he has one about suicide that I really recommend. I'll have the link below for that one. He actually had two and he redid it. And these are very long episodes that you can, that's what I do. I listen to a little bit to, today and then tomorrow, but I just decided, okay, I got some questions from my audience, but I want to treat myself and I want to have my number one podcaster with me to do this together. So thank you so much, Kurt, for being here with us. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for having That's just about the nicest introduction I've ever had in my life. That's really flattering. <laughs> well, I I'll always have like the... it when I hear oh, about other oh. clinicians listening, because I'm always like, you know. Do they? <laughs> well, yeah, because I, I, I just want clinicians to benefit, because uh, we can all share information. I can learn from you. You can learn from me. Uh, but I'm always worried that other clinicians are going to judge me as being a hack. But it, so it's always validating when I hear about clinicians listening. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And you are, and you are also very critical of our profession sometimes. So yeah. I'm sure that for many people, for me, it's 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 great because I am too. I there's so many things we could do a whole episode on on what is wrong with our with our. Well, our training actually, right? So, but that's not the topic today. But uh, I think that's one of the most valuable things that you do for us clinicians, really, mm -hmm. to wake us up to these things. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. wow, I know you heard that from your teacher, but you know what? Mm, let's rethink that. Yeah. It can be harmful. And uh, so I'm sure you have a lot of people who learn from you. I certainly do. I love your deep dive. So, wow. Let's start. We're going to talk. So just so my listeners know, we're going to have two parts of today's episode. The first part, we're going to dive into suicide and we're going to talk about warning signs and risk factors and your experience with that as well. Your questions, because we all have, there's not one person on earth that doesn't have questions about suicide, right? Mm -hmm. But we're going, I'm going to answer some of the questions that were sent to me. And then we'll go into the second part. When I'm going, I actually, when I wrote to Kirk, I said, you're going to be my Bob. So for those who don't listen to his podcast, it's called Psychology in Seattle. Bob is one of, kind of one of the co-hosts, but it's his great friend, lifelong friend. And just a wonderful clinician as well. I can tell by all his, you know, observations and just his voice. I, I wish he, he should do the, you know, like one of those meditation things because his mm -hmm. voice is so soothing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So he and Kirk, what he does to Bob all the time is ask these very, very personal questions. Mm -hmm. And there is a beautiful episode of, of both of them crying, actually. It's one of my faves. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to make you cry, but I am going to to dive deep into your life and ask some some deep questions. I hopefully okay. that would be fun for you. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. But let's start with suicide. Well, first of all, Kirk, uh, tell us what made you decide to do podcasts when nobody even knew about it? When, how many, how many years ago was that? Uh, 14 plus years ago, I was obsessed with podcasts myself in the mid aughts because I I'm a multitasker and when I'm commuting or when I'm mowing the lawn or doing the laundry, I am very easily bored. And so mm. I was always looking for something to entertain me while I did these things. And I originally would listen to audiobooks on cassette and then, mm -hmm. and then eventually they became digitized. And then that was a pretty easy transition into podcast listening. And there were very few podcasts in the mid aughts, but I listened to all the science and psychology ones. 
Mm-hmm. And at some point I thought, there's only three psychology podcasts. And if I made my own podcast, I, I would, even if I was the worst, which I'm sure I would be, I would be the fourth best English speaking podcast about psychology in the world. And so I decided to uh, give it a shot. Plus at the time I was, I was taking a break from being a professor and I had an itch to lecture and teach. And so it fit well into that uh, Mm -hmm. need, you know, so I started a podcast. Yeah. 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 Uh, Do you cringe when you listen to your first ones or do you ever listen to your first one? (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, 99% of the first episodes from the first few years I took down because I mean, they're not really? horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're they're not horrible or anything, but yeah, they're not our best work. Listen, I was still figuring out what I had no idea what I was doing. I had no training. Yeah. I had no guidance. I had no mentor. And also, th- there wasn't a lot of good examples out there in 2008. Mm, uh, yeah. a, a YouTube channels, podcasts were, you know, they're not what they are today. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kirk, let's start with the, I think, number one question that is always in our minds and especially my audience. What leads a person to suicide in your experience? Mm -hmm. Very complicated question. It depends, of course, on the individual. But after doing my deep dive on the research and thinking about my own clients, because, you know, being a therapist for 25 years, you come across a, a fair amount of people who think about suicide chronically or um, temporarily in a significant way, attempts and this sort of thing. And it's our job as therapists to really go uh, in depth with people as to what's going on with them. How do they feel their experience of it, the ups and the downs, the events. And I, you know, really ruminated on all that for a long time and uh, also looked at the research in terms of what the current, prevailing theories are. And I developed my five main uh, reasons as to why people will uh, think or attempt suicide or complete suicide. And the the first three are perhaps the most important is one is, is that there has to be some kind of distress, which makes mm-hmm. sense, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's depression, anxiety, rejection, grief, a physical problem, loss, financial problems, uh, just some kind of distress, some kind of pain or fear or depression or hope, you know, that kind of. And then the second thing is because we all go through distress in life. We all have a medical problem or we lose a job or someone breaks up with us. So the second part of it is, is key in relation to the first part, which is that we have to have a perceived hopelessness about the distress. So if if you get dumped or someone cheats on you for for 3 years and breaks up with you, that's a big distressful, that's a big stressful moment. It's a lot of distress, a lot of pain, a lot of uncertainty, but if you have hope, if you believe that well, it sucks now, but I'm guessing things will get better in the future, then you aren't likely to start thinking about suicide. Whereas if you have the distress and the hopelessness, mm-hmm. then you're going down the road towards starting to have intrusive thoughts about suicide. Or maybe in the beginning, it'll be a thought of just like, maybe if I mm-hmm. just didn't exist, or if I could just somehow numb this entire experience, how do I get there? And then suicide starts to uh, creep in there. The third element that research has found that I have found to be true as well is what we call perceived, uh, which is thwarted belongingness. So. That's Thomas Joyner, right? Yeah. So you believe that you are being rejected by whoever it is that you want to be accepted by. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it could be a partner, a family. Sometimes it could be society if you're being Mm -hmm. oppressed or, or you just feel like the world has left you behind or something. You are not only are you isolated and you don't belong to a, a you know an attachment or a group of people or a society or something or a family but you're being thwarted you're being actively rejected from mm-hmm. that group and so and this is all perception of course some people aren't actively being thwarted but they feel that way it seems that way to them so you have the distress you have the hopelessness about it and then you have this perceived 
I'm being rejected. Because again, if you have distress and you have hope, hopelessness, but you feel like people are accepting of you mm -hmm. and listening to you, you can, for, you know, a therapist, for example, or a friend mm -hmm. or a family, and you're just like, oh my God, my life is in shambles. I have complete hopelessness about it, but you're here for me. So thank yeah. you about that. Kind of holds you back in a way. Well, it's funny, Paula, you're already making me cry because I'm, you know, it's, it's already making me think about <laughs> like just people that I've worked with along these lines. Um, so, so yeah, so those three things mm -hmm. are um, uh, the breeding ground for the beginnings of the mm -hmm. thoughts that lead to thinking about suicide. And then what leads to attempts and completion are acquired means and acquired capability. So mm -hmm. you as an individual can have a lot of thoughts about suicide, but until you have not only the means to do so, an actual method that you find is suitable to what you're looking for, and also the capability, because one can have all the motivation in the world, one can have all the means, but if they haven't overcome the fear of mm -hmm. taking the leap, if you will, then it's it, that's another protective factor. So when we see those five things, we get very concerned about someone attempting. Yeah, I want to stay when, uh, on, with the first one, just an observation. I want to hear your thoughts on that. You talk about distress mm -hmm. and the idea that we have of distress is these overwhelming emotions and things like that or something happened in your life. But sometimes we get clients who come to us and said, here's why I want to die. I don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's not distress in the conventional way that we talk about distress, but numbness. Right. That's another mm -hmm. word that they use. I, I feel numb. And the other day I read something that uh, it was really, really hit a chord on, with me was uh, numbness is not uh, is not about not feeling emotions, but having too much. Mm. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So the distress can be tricky in that mm -hmm. way. Yeah. The the distress label is a very large umbrella under which a lot of things reside. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Have you lost uh, a, a client to suicide? I, I haven't. I had a client. Well, technically I have, but I hadn't met them yet. I was about mm. to have an intake with them that day, but earlier that morning before I ever met them they had taken their life yeah mm, sorry about that that's that's what tough about you have you have you had someone no no but i've i've lost my father and I, mm. yeah i have a personal story yeah with with oh, suicide i'm sorry yeah so let's talk about warning signs that's yeah. the second question I mean, how do i know i mean i have a, a loved one who is in in distress i mean, or they're struggling with mental illness or they're going through a very difficult moment how on earth do I know that they're they're just going through a, a rough patch or can they become suicidal? Is there a way to know? But before, sorry, Kirk, before you, you answer, I want to read something because you're talking, we're talking about warning signs. And I often, since I started this work like 17 years ago, uh, as a journalist at the time, not a therapist, but I I truly believe in the value of education. That's what I started doing. I wrote a book and I had a website because I, especially when it comes to warning signs, I really believe in the value of it. And I want to read something that I received a couple of weeks ago from one of my listeners that I think illustrates that. And I wanted to comment on that and talk about warning signs. So what she said was, um, I found your podcast last week and it's been really helpful because I feel as if I'm going on my grieving journey on my own, despite the support that I have from friends and family. But I wish I had found your warning, uh, suicide warning signs episode sooner. My husband had two signs which you described. One was gathering information from me so I could access all his bank accounts, the mortgage, utilities, all of that. And he also have a, had a very upbeat demeanor the day before he hung himself. So this is something that I talk about on, in, in, in this episode. It's just me talking about warning signs, but you, know, you don't be fooled by someone who has been struggling all their lives, who has been really bad. And it's, all of a sudden, they're so much better. Because sometimes that's the sign that they are at peace with the decision to take their own lives. 
-hmm. And that's why they seem to be much better. So these are the signs. So it's just uh, a comment that someone made that really illustrates the importance of knowing the warning signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really tragic. Um, in terms of warning signs, the, the main thing that I would recommend is that when you have a close enough relationship with someone where you can talk both yourself, both of you and the other person can talk about your emotions and your experience, then there's much more likelihood of being able to detect the things or even just flat out ask them, are they thinking about suicide, which I would also recommend. If you have a, particularly if it's a spouse and you have an open relationship along those lines, you should at least try to cultivate that. Because looking for warning signs is great, of course, but if you're in a, if, a, if you're in a situation where you're trying to detect something uh, against the individual's will, if you will, you know, because mm -hmm. you could just ask them. And if, if they're not being truthful with you and you're trying to detect things, that's a really impossible situation to be in. Uh, so the other thing is, even for the person that emailed into you, even if they had seen it as a warning sign, which why would you think that it's your husband's in a good mm -hmm. mood? Why would you think that? And that other detail about uh, wrapping up your affairs is also not something that's widely understood. So I don't blame the person for not knowing that. But even if she had recognized them as warning signs, what could she have done? I mean, there's, you know, the situation is so far gone. Could she have done something? Yeah, maybe, but it's certainly not mm -hmm. her fault. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, so I feel like a lot of times people are beating themselves up because they didn't know the warning signs or they didn't do anything or something. And, and it's just a, it's a very difficult situation, but um, if you are looking for warning signs, one, like I said, you want to cultivate a, a good relationship with them where you can talk about your emotions and you can just literally ask them, uh, are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? And as long as you aren't, you don't react in a way that will push them out of your mm -hmm. life, like you freak out or you get angry or you call the authorities if it's not necessary. I mean, sometimes it is, but if it's not, um, if you don't do anything like that, then in all likelihood, the individual will actually appreciate and want to tell you. Most mm -hmm. people do say something because they do want to reach out. They do want to connect. And so it's not as if people who are thinking about suicide uh, usually hide it. Sometimes they do, obviously. But so that's one thing. The other things to look for are the things that I talked about. Distress. If someone mm -hmm. just lost a job, if they are going through a financial crisis, if they just got broken up with if they suddenly have a disability, like they can no longer walk or see, or they have chronic pain and there's no um, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, some kind of distress is a sign. Mm -hmm. uh, hopelessness, also a sign, thwarted belongingness. You might be there for them, but they might feel like no one is there for them. Uh, also, like I said, acquired means, if they have a gun, if they because you can have all the intent in the world but if you don't have a means then at least until you gain those means you're probably not going to be able to attempt whereas statistics show and it's obvious that if there's a loaded gun in the house that's that the individual has access to all it takes is five seconds for them to grab it and shoot themselves mm -hmm. so uh, having that gun is a massive risk factor and then the acquired capability which you wouldn't necessarily know but other signs like withdrawal, when people will withdraw from us, I wouldn't say that if that's all you saw, I would assume the person was thinking about suicide, but it's a sign. Substance abuse also, particularly in men, uh, is a sign not only of emotional suffering, but of the development of the capability, because often, I can't remember the exact stat, but a sizable percentage of people who attempt are intoxicated, again, particularly men. Um, depression is also a sign if someone has chronic depression. Uh, it's a myth that everyone who attempts or thinks about suicide is depressed and everyone who's depressed thinks about suicide, but it, it is an association. If someone mm -hmm. suddenly decides they want to buy a gun and there's not really a particular reason or they want to borrow a gun or something, then that's a sign that I would look for. Again, in isolation, that's not a sign, but when you look at everything, um, 
yeah, uh, wrapping up loose ends, as your, your emailer talked about, giving away stuff, contacting old friends, saying, you know, say, hey, I just wanted to say I appreciated you in my life or whatever. Uh, if the individual has dark thoughts, you can mm-hmm. often, that can often be a warning sign yeah. where they have dark thoughts about uh, the world. Like they might say something like, I don't know. I just kind of feel like this world is just a cesspool of idiots and terrible people. And I I sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, I just, I mean, maybe that's all they say or something like, um, also an increase in aggressive thoughts and behavior. If they get violent with other people, that can also be kind of a warning sign. And then with children, you would look for declining grades, getting in trouble, change of friends, drug use, isolation, this kind of thing. And with kids, it can happen pretty rapidly. So Obviously, you'd want to be uh, on the ball with that. But again, if you have a kid, and I've worked with many kids in situations like this, and you start seeing those signs, the chances that they're thinking about suicide isn't very high. The chances they're gonna, that they're going to attempt is even lower. But better safe than sorry. So it's not I'm assuming my kid is thinking about suicide. It's my kid might be in, you know, suffering from something. Let's do a holistic approach of cultivating and going down a road of a campaign where I can have a close relationship with my kid so that if they are thinking about suicide, I can ask them and they would be able to tell me and or we'd be able to get them to talk with a therapist and they'd be able to trust that person. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. There's there's other warning signs, of course, but for the sake of time, I'll just say. Yeah, you're you're talking about kids, but I'm, I'm thinking how hard it is to spot these signs and to actually make sense out of it because teenagers for example they, all, they it's part of being a teenager to withdraw right right uh, right exactly and that's <laughs> why i would hope that even when your kid is being morose or in their room or saying they don't want to mm-hmm. hang out with you anymore i would hope that you had cultivated a relationship with that person prior to that phase that if you really had to you could sit down with them for 10 minutes and just say hey you know I, i'll leave you alone but I, I've just been seeing some things and I, I love you. I care about you. Mm-hmm. How are things going? Are, do you feel, do you feel happy? And on the kids like, yeah, I'm happy. I just don't want you in my life anymore because I want to hang out with my friends and you'd be like, Oh, okay. You know? Uh, <laughs> so I would hope that you would, but what I would end up um, seeing families would come to my office is there was a lot of damage prior to that, mm-hmm. which obviously contributes to the, all the factors that lead to suicidal thoughts anyway. And so we were really starting over with the, these relationships. And so you, you want to do a lot of prep before your kid enters teenage years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to read another email that was sent to me. It kind of shows the other side of the warning signs, like no warning signs, because we hear that a lot too. If, if there was nothing. Yeah. And there, there are two sides of that. When you, when you hear from someone, I don't understand, he or she was happy, everything was going well, and then this happened. But then years later, you in hindsight, I know because I feel the same about my dad. At the time, I knew that he was going through a rough time. There was a lot going on. But now when I look back, he's like a checklist of warning signs. I mean, he gave all of them. I don't think there's one that wasn't there. But of course, at the time, it's the same thing. Well, he was getting older. He was having financial difficulties. Who doesn't, right? you're not going to think about it Mm -hmm. but I'm going to read something from Risa she said my mother died by suicide last August she didn't confide in anyone that she had thoughts of self-harm she didn't leave any notes or say goodbye to anyone she prepared no will and gave no possessions away no prior suicide attempts it appeared that she took her life impulsively impulsively how common is it for victims of suicide to suddenly make the decision to take their life and do it unplanned? Is it possible she never had suicidal ideation prior to the day she took her life? Mm-hmm. Well, research shows that's rare, but it does happen. It's hard to know because we can't ask them after they die if they had been thinking about it secretly. But it is rarer, uh, fairly mm-hmm. rare. I don't know the percentages, but... Yeah, it, there are cases where people will have that experience. Um, maybe it was sort of in the back of their mind, but they weren't really, mm-hmm. it wasn't at the front of their mind. They're just like, yeah, you know, if push comes to shove, you know, maybe I'll, I'll resort to that. And then they get to it. And particularly, I think for older people, they get to a certain age and they just, 
have seen the decline of their health and they see the writing on the wall and they mm -hmm. think that they have they have hopelessness about it they feel isolated um there's just a lot of people who are acting like everything's fine when everything is not fine even to people that are close to them they mm -hmm. From a very yeah. early age, learned that they can't trust other people, even though they could. They just believe they can't, and they just don't wear their heart on their sleeve, and mm -hmm. they are suffering in silence. I, you know, yeah. so many people who are suffering greatly, and you would never know a thing. And you could have them, you could see them. They could be, you could be a parent, and you could see them twice a week, and and hang out with them, have lunch, mm -hmm. have a laugh. But as soon as you leave their house, they're miserable and and they don't even though in their heads they're like, I could trust my child, my adult child to tell them this. They just don't because it's just a pattern of theirs. So, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's really and that obviously can lead to the factors that would lead someone to to think about suicide. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just thinking of a, of an experience I had with a good friend. And, uh, and again, my belief in, in knowing, I mean, the, the paying attention, being attentive to this. And, and once you know, you can't unknow it. Uh, it, was, it happened after, you know, I had written the book and everything. So I had a friend call me one day and it took me, Kirk, maybe a minute to identify. She was calling me and talking about the past because that's another one in science. You become very nostalgic about the good times in your life. You don't, you don't talk about the future. It's all about reminiscing. And she was calling me and I immediately asked her, I said, listen, I, I can hear you in your voice that there is something wrong. Are you calling to say goodbye? Mm. Are you thinking about suicide? And she broke down. Wow. Yeah. And she started crying. And I said, listen, uh, let, let me try to help you. It's your decision. It's your life. I understand that it's, it's a lot going on right now. Let me just try to help you. Let's, let's see a professional. Mm -hmm. And I helped her find a professional. Just give me time, just a few days, maybe a month. And then we'll talk about this again. And she's still alive. This was, I don't wow. know, 10 years ago. Wow. So that's the value for me of being attentive. Um, when and something asking like, the question. I mean, and asking the question. There's yeah. a good chance that she would have said, huh? No. But you asked the question. And that, Yeah. And she actually so. said, yes, I have everything planned for this week. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 the, the, the lesson that I would hope people would pull away is ask the question, just, mm -hmm. just ask. So many people are afraid to ask, and it's, it's not offensive. It doesn't motivate people to do it, and if uh, better safe than sorry, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you, you, you were saying, well, sometimes they never show, right? And I was listening to an episode yesterday uh, doing my insomnia last night of your podcast and you were talking to Berto and he, you were talking about the anniversary, how you had like 13 hours of live and, and then you found out that he was feeling really sick all day that they never shared with you. So that's one of those things, right? How would you know? Yeah. You overheard him tell your wife, right? Yeah. A year later, I overhear him telling my wife that his experience of our 13 hour live stream, he was like on the brink of going to the hospital the whole time. And I had no idea. No idea. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I mean, it was him and I in a room staring at each other for 13 hours. I obviously mm. was observing a lot of things about him, but he, but he, because of his upbringing is very good at masking mm. how he really feels. Yeah. Yeah. Safety plan. Safety plan is something that you talk at length on your uh, your deep dive. And I do believe the safety plan is one of those things that's so helpful, not just for clinicians, even though the word is very technical, safety plan, right? That's what we yeah. do as clinicians. But anyone can do that. And that's kind of like the next step. Let's say you, well, you, I, you're attentive and you ask the question, say, what do I do now? I mean, how can I not prevent, because you're not responsible again, like I told my friend, it's your life, but what can someone do to help this person and to, to have this safety plan? What is a safety plan and how can you go about of creating mm -hmm. one? Yeah, well, I would say, ideally, you would have a professional that was overseeing all this, but the things that I do with my clients is I 
do these following nine things, and this is what I supervise and teach my trainees to do as well. And you work with, you have to work with the client. It's not something that you can do to a client. You know, you have to get them completely on board. It has to be very collaborative, often with their family, whoever lives with them. Number one is to identify and plan for triggers. So uh, you can look into the past and know when spikes of intention of suicide increased. For some people, it might be at, in the evening. It might be when they're drinking. It might be when they get in a fight with their partner. It might be, um, I don't know, just whatever, just looking at whatever triggers. So you have to make plans for that. You have to say, okay, we know what might lead to spikes of intention. And so we, if, a, if, a, if a trigger is predictable into the future, then we have to be more robust in our, in our activity around those times. The other thing, and number two, is uh, identifying things to avoid, like alcohol, guns, conflict, um, this kind of thing. So you want to look at uh, changing behaviors so that you can reduce the intention and the potential behavior. Number three is removing access to means, getting rid of guns, mm -hmm. maybe getting rid of alcohol, getting rid of knives, if, if that's the thing, pills, uh, literally getting them out of the house. Um, a common thing in the States is, since there's a lot of guns, is to get a family member come over and just take all the guns and ammo. And you have that person as a, you tell them literally, you need to take all these things because I'm on a safety plan where I might kill myself. And so we need to get these out of the house. Um, number four is making a list of support people that you can contact mm -hmm. and be with uh, during these times. Because when you are alone, you are astronomically more likely to attempt than if you, you can have a lot of intention to die and kill yourself. But if you are sitting right next to your mom or your spouse or your best friend, someone that you can depend on, someone that knows the situation, the chance of you attempting is almost zero. So uh, it, it certainly can happen. But um, so having those people on board, I will reach out to those people, involve them in the safety planning, because that's a huge protective factor for suicide. Number five um, is, uh, well, just a continuation of that, but more specifically around monitoring. So like, um, I might work with their spouse or their parent or their friend who say the current spike of intention is happening and I say, okay, until I see you again, client, I'm going to call your spouse and say that they can't let you out of their site 24 seven, you know, because and the alternative to this, because if I'm that worried, if the risk is that high in a client, I will say, if you don't let me have your partner or your mom mm. monitor you 24 seven, I actually have to involuntarily commit you. I have to put you in a hospital. So this is, this is a, a more reason, probably a more palatable choice for you than actually going into the hospital. So that's when someone is imminently at risk of, of dying over the mm -hmm. next 24 hours. Um, uh, and then I would also work with the support person around how they should respond if, for example, the client locked themselves in the bathroom or something, calling 911, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Number six is listing effective coping skills, uh, increasing protective factors, like stabilizing your life, going to therapy, getting support, having creativity, increasing self-esteem, also actual emotional regulation skills. Um, number seven, I just say, you know, look, when in doubt, call 911. Um, sometimes you have to be very, very explicit about that. Number eight, establish uh, contingencies for no-shows. This is more of a clinician thing, so I'll move mm -hmm. past that. Yeah. Number nine is, um, and this is another clinician thing, is summarizing this all in the the documentation. Mm -hmm. So mainly it has to do with identifying triggers, knowing what to avoid, getting rid of things that are likely to lead to uh, an attempt and having a support system, not only emotional support, but also potentially there just physically with you all the time. That's, mm -hmm. that's the gist of my safety plan. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, the heaviness 
of, of being that support person, because sometimes, especially we see that in parents that they want to do all of that on their own and the importance of, no, just get more people. If it's mm -hmm. a teenager, get some friends involved or maybe the parents of those friends or the teachers, talk to the school. But uh, I wanted to comment on that because I don't want whoever is listening to this to think, okay, it's your responsibility to save that life. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, if you are a family member, it's normal, particularly if you're mm -hmm. a parent, mm -hmm. to feel responsible. You know, when your five-year-old is walking next to a street, you, you know, understandably feel responsible for making sure your child doesn't run out into the street. Um, you are responsible for that kind of a thing. You're responsible for making sure they're wearing their seatbelt. There are things that you're understandably and should feel responsible for when they and usually we're talking about teenagers but certainly there are some rare kids who will think about suicide but usually we're talking about teenagers by the time they get there particularly in the states these human beings have their own free will they have their own lives and there's a a bit of a a, a myth that somehow you have a lot of control over the over what they mm -hmm. do yeah. and so uh having a an appreciation for that transition into that phase you're still responsible to some extent but there are many 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 wonderful wonderful parents who have lost their children their teenagers to suicide even though those parents were attentive knowledgeable loving did everything they should have and the child just was determined or there were outside forces or something else was going on and the parent in those situations should never blame themselves for mm -hmm. the completion or the attempt or the thoughts. And uh, it, it's something because the reason why it's not that you just, just release yourself from responsibility. It's that when parents are, when people and support systems are overly responsible, one, they will suffer unnecessarily, but two, they end up acting in defensive ways. They will either withdraw from the individual, mm -hmm. which isn't helpful or they will try to control, which isn't helpful. They will um, chastise the individual um, because they're because the support person is freaking out. They don't. They're just like, "Why are you doing this? You know, you're ruining mm -hmm. my life." How, like, how can you, right? How can yeah, you? Yeah. How can you possibly do this? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, not helpful. So the the main reason why us clinicians are trying to get support people to relax a little bit is that you're not helping the situation by taking on the responsibility completely on your shoulders it's you're you're going to make it worse it's going to be too much yeah, yeah. so yeah you know uh but it's hard you know trying to convince a parent that it's not their fault yeah yeah it's really <laughs> yeah. tough yeah it's not it's not easy no no and uh, we're we're talking about responsibility and one of the things that i see with our peers and i'm sure you see the same is that Many clinicians, I actually have an episode, episode 31, for those who haven't listened to them, with Dr. Steven Reisner. And we talk about the, how difficult it is to find a clinician if you say you're suicidal, mm. right? I have suicidal thoughts, and clinicians are so afraid of liability. So that's something that you cover, and I would love to hear a little bit about that because I wish we had more information out there about liability and uh, I mean, how, how, how can you be as a clinician careful about that, but still take on those patients and not reject them again, because it just adds to the feeling of rejection that they have. Mm -hmm. So when is a therapist or can a therapist be responsible that's quote unquote, but liable for that loss? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you referred earlier to how I will often rant and rave about the our industry and the problems with various clinicians or cultural elements. And this is one of them, which is to be a therapist and to just blanketly reject clients because they're thinking about suicide, I find to be atrocious. Um, and if it was just one or two therapists, fine. But if it's a, if it's a trend and you have a client who is thinking about suicide and, and, they're specifically looking for a therapist to help them with that. And, you know, the first three therapists they contact reject them. I find that to just be a crime, honestly. It's, it's, it's horrific. So 
Now, might one specialize, might one have too many clients like that in their caseload, you know, maybe, but um, uh, so, you know, it's it, it case by case, I suppose. But in terms of responsibility, and, it's, and the other issue is, is that there are so many of us that lack education and proper guidance around ethics and law. Uh, there are trainings out there, but a lot of them are really terrible. And I've been to a lot of these terrible continuing education classes. So it's really hard. You know, I'm in this perfect privileged position as a professor. I, you know, I was program director for a while. I, I was in contact with hundreds, thousands of clinicians and professors around the world and in my community. I was, you know, talking to the government department of health. I was talking to lawyers and you know, all these other people. And it was just a part of my job. I got paid to do it to some extent. And it was still hard for me to find proper guidance and expert advice. It took me a long time before mm -hmm. I found someone that I could really depend on. Plus, sometimes they're expensive and you don't, you're, you're struggling, you're trying to pay off your student loans. So it's kind of a weird system where there's, you know, 99, especially on Facebook and these kinds of places, the information that's out there is Oh, so misleading. It's the blind leading the blind. I'm on Reddit. Yeah. It, it, yeah. The, the stuff that people will advise and then a bunch of people will just agree with it. it it's it is it's a bad situation. And so it is. Yeah. Um, so I don't blame clinicians for being lost. And for those who are lost and know they're lost, uh, they're even in a better position because at least they know they're lost. But I can imagine those people saying, I don't know the situation with suicide and my responsibility and what I'm liable for. So I'm just going to avoid the whole thing or it makes me scared. So it's a hard, I don't know what to do as a therapist. It kind of trips me up. So I'm just going to avoid the whole thing. You know, I get that. It's a problem with our industry. It's a problem with us as a collective. It's a problem with our training programs. Da, da, da. Anyway, but in different jurisdictions, there are different precedents regarding what we're responsible for it. In Washington state, we have a court precedent that uh, uh, establishes that us as therapists are responsible to react reasonably to situations of danger regarding our clients, whether it's harm to themselves or other people. We're not responsible if they commit a crime of violence or against themselves or other people, you know, or suicide. Um, but we are responsible for acting reasonably. And that's the key distinction because often it's to be like, how can I be responsible for a client's behavior? You're not responsible for a client's behavior. You're responsible to act reasonably. And to act reasonably is to do what I, we've already talked about to some extent, the things that I, we've already talked about, noticing the warning signs, asking the questions, having the, the safety plan. There are a lot of other things, obviously, treatment wise, documentation, getting consultation, mm -hmm. getting supervision, getting having a lawyer that you can talk to because it's not, you know, it's not terribly often that you will as a therapist come across someone who is significantly at risk of suicide. You might have, you know, 10, maybe you have more because because you have that specialty, but the average therapist might have five, 10 percent of their clients who are thinking about it and maybe far less than that having high medium to high risk. So it when it occurs, you just need to have a system in place and you don't need to do it all the time. And it, it would be kind of a rare event. So you just have to kick it into higher gear during those moments. So um, you're not uh, responsible if they take the action, but you're responsible for and if the client is lying to you the whole time or mm -hmm resisting you, um, you still need to act reasonably. Like it might mean you have to break confidentiality and contact their family and say, by the way, they are not compliant with treatment. And so yeah. I, I just wanted to alert you uh, in all likelihood. Again, if you talk to a lawyer case by case basis, the client couldn't sue you for breaking confidentiality because you had a reasonable reason to take action to break confidentiality. So there are things you can do. Mm -hmm. There are things that you need to do, but there, but you know, as long as you have a protocol, and I teach my protocol and walk my protocol, uh, I walk my supervisees and trainees through it. It's pretty cut and dry. There's not a lot of thinking to it, and that's mm -hmm. what I find is so many clinicians, they run into a client that has suicidal thoughts, and it's like, it's as if they've never predicted that could ever happen in therapy, and it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? Because if any anyone knows that that could happen, every yeah. layperson understands that. 
there's a chance that some of your clients will think about suicide, but somehow so many therapists, because they're ill-prepared, ill-trained, that they run into it, they hear it from a client, and they just freeze out of terror mm -hmm. because they don't know what to do next. And that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. My suggestion is always just include it in, it's, it's part of your intake form. It mm -hmm. has to be there. I, I remember when I interviewed Stacy Friedenthal. I don't know if you know her, but she has two great books on, on how to help suicidal patients and then for loved ones, how to help them. And she said that when she was giving a training to the clinicians and she asked one of them, well, have you had a suicidal patient before? And she said, oh, no, no, I never had it. So, oh, how do you know that? Um, do you ask the question? So, oh, no, why would I ask that? <laughs> And she said, oh, no wonder you have never had a suicide. You have to ask. It's, yeah. It has to be part of your intake. Yeah. Even if they come to you and if it's a recent thing that happened, you never, and they even say, well, I never thought about taking it. You have to ask, yeah. are you thinking now because you're struggling right now? Is it, it has to be, and it has to be natural, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, most people who think about suicide are ashamed of themselves. Mm -hmm. even to their therapists. Yeah. And by not asking, you're kind of sending a message that it's shameful. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah. by asking, you're saying, especially if you ask in a, in a non-shameful tone. Non -judge yeah, non-judgmental. Yeah. Then it opens the door for them to, yeah. to tell yeah. you how they feel. You know, I have, I have an online course on how to help suicidal uh, uh, page people. And one of the things I say, well, before you ask the question, check in with yourself. What is how are you going to react if yeah. they say yes? That's yeah. very important because sometimes you ask the question and then you go, oh, and, and even the way you ask, right? You can ask, well, listen, I, I can see you're struggling. Are you, are you thinking about taking your life? Or you can say, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? Right, right. Same question, right? Yeah. Completely different. Yeah. So it's not just about asking the question, but also checking in with yourself to see what do I think about suicide? Do, do I have that? you know, stupid dichotomy, is it, oh, it's for cowards, or is it, oh, no, because, uh, check with yourself first. Yeah. How do, how do you see suicide? Yeah, the countertransference, not only for clinicians, but I suppose the reactivity for family members is key, because mm -hmm. if you have a lot of misinformation, or you have a lot of unresolved grief yourself about suicides in your own, you know, previously in your life, then you're possibly going to suffer when you start hearing about this new suicidal uh, uh, intention from a new person and or you will react so poorly that the individual will shy away from you or even have more motivation to mm -hmm. take their life you know if if you yeah. give this impression like you're thwartedly uh, you know yeah. if you're thwarting them <laughs> then yeah. that is, you're not to blame, but you know, you're not helping the situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing that I always want my trainees to get to is to a place where their reactivity, it's, it's like no other, it's just like any other conversation because mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts are very common. They, yeah. you know, there, there are whole swaths of people who think about it periodically there for years and years. And uh, men, most of them haven't attempted and will never complete, but they do think about it. Mm -hmm. And it should just be like, do you think, hey, I just wanted to ask, do you ever think about taking your life? Do you ever think about suicide? The client says, well, to be honest, yeah, sometimes I think about it. And, you know, you, f you feel the weight of it as mm -hmm. a clinician. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's not a minor thing, but it doesn't throw you off. It's not just like, Oh, what, what do I do? It's just like, okay, tell me more, you know, what's, yeah. uh, tell, tell me more about that. When, when does it happen? Do you want to talk mm -hmm. about that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and, and then of course you enter into the treatment of yeah. whatever is mm -hmm. driving those things, which we haven't talked about, which is pretty complicated. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Kirk, let's go into the second part. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge. But before we do that, I just want to read two more emails. One is about grief, because as I told you before we started recording, uh, many of my listeners, they have lost a loved one to suicide. But this one is interesting because it's someone she barely knew and she's struggling with it and she doesn't know why. Uh, but I think there's a word she uses here that kind of uh, gives us a hint. She said, I, I would like guida guidance on dealing with grief from a suicide of an acquaintance. This is a situation where you know the per I know the person, but I don't know them well, right? Her well. At the same time, I'm grieving. 
it's not appropriate for me to reach out to the people that know the person well and ask what happened. She died of suicide and I had no indication that she was in trouble or that, that she was even thinking about that. She was always very positive and accepting of me. What are your thoughts? Um, can you read it again? What's yeah. The, what's the question? The is question that... is, she was, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because she's struggling. So why am I grieving? This is someone I barely knew. Oh, uh, so she's wondering why she's still grieving, even mm -hmm. though she didn't know her that well. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to explore it with her, but I would imagine if I were in her shoes, it's a sad thing to lose anyone, even if they're not particularly super close. One, two, there's a lot of questions to get raised when people die that we know of. There's a lot of Mm -hmm. Am I going to die? Are other people going to die? Are yeah. we all at risk? What What's happening? The uncertainty of it. Also, some people just have a lot of empathy. They just care a lot. And mm -hmm. they could hear about someone that they don't even know. You know, just yeah. someone on the internet that has a tragedy and they can really feel it because they just really mm -hmm. have a lot yeah. of empathy for other people's feelings. Um. Yeah, you know, I, I could imagine a lot of different things happening. The The mm -hmm. bottom line is, uh, I, I don't know the tone of the question, but emotions are normal, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> grieving is normal and fear and pain is normal. And yeah. to not have it is to not be human. And so, uh, and I'm guessing that a lot of people are having those feelings and they're either not talking about it or trying to deny it. So I'm not hearing anything strange is my Yeah, thought. yeah. But that's the thing about grief, right? We don't talk about it in, in our Western world. And it's something that you hide and you feel by yourself. You don't share it. But I think something she said, that what caught my attention. She said she was always very positive and accepting of me. So there was a connection there, mm. right? The accepting yeah. of me, it shows that there was value in this relationship for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, I forgot, I didn't pick up on that 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 could be a loss of for the individual that's grieving mm -hmm. of wow you know maybe I don't have enough of that in my life and the little bit that I did I lost yeah yeah and maybe you don't have a lot of people around you that you feel accepts you mm -hmm. right so that's a big loss mm -hmm. Okay, so one more, and then we'll, we'll go into the second part. My name is Henry. I live in Orlando, Florida. In the last few years, I have been struggling to have a balance and move forward in my life. I've started listening to the podcast a few years ago, and it has helped me a lot to understand a little bit about what's going on inside of me. So this is for me. I would like to congratulate you, Paula, for the, for the book and the podcast. Uh, I would also like to thank all the people interviewed because this information was fundamental in my learning process through the hard experiences that I've had. Congratulations for your beautiful and fundamental work, which helps many people around the world. So thank you, Henry. That's great. That's why I do this. It's wonderful when we hear, isn't it, Kirk, when we hear something like that. Wow. It's making yeah, a difference. It makes it all worth it, right? Yeah. So two questions from my sister to you, Kirk. She's a big fan. <laughs> uh, one of them, Renata, that's her name, my older sister. She says, she starts with a caveat. She goes, I realize this is generalizing, but what accounts for the difficulty many Americans have that they have so much trouble showing affection or forming attachments in terms of friendships? As someone who moved here as an almost middle-aged person, I have, I have experienced that many, many times over. Mm -hmm. Capitalism, uh, materialism, isolation, lack of understanding of our emotions, toxic masculinity, all those things. So, and it's generalization, of course, because I live in a circle of people that values all these things and and I'm mm -hmm. an American and the people I'm friends with are American. So it's not everyone, but we as a society and mainstream American society, we value money and materialism and how we look to strangers more than anything else. And when you focus on that, you don't focus on what's important and you will gear your life towards acquisition of money and things. And also you'll, 
uh, and class, you know, markers of class. And, and one of the biggest markers of higher class is a bigger house. And the bigger your house, the more isolated you are, even from the few people that you actually live with. So, you know, everyone has their own car and everyone has their own room and everyone has their own office and everyone has their own bathroom and it's more convenient. And it's also a marker of class. It's also a marker of success. And, and I, you know, fully appreciate the convenience of that, but the side effect is that we have almost no contact with other human beings Mm. and it's it it makes us uh depressed more depressed more anxious more suicidal uh, more distressed more paranoid um more prone to conspiracy theories and weird ideas like QAnon, and also it just makes you not understand your needs you shut your emotions down you drink more you smoke more pot and when someone comes along like renata and says hey let's be a friend you're so numbed out and freaked out and scared mm-hmm. of individuals that you just yeah. you just don't even notice that this is a blessing that's passing right in front of you that you should absolutely take advantage of that and actually be that mm-hmm. person's friend but yeah. uh but yeah general americans will do otherwise yeah yeah for us i mean we are immigrants and of course the way that we relate we, it comes from our culture it's very cultural too and i i see that too things very small things right uh, like if you in Brazil, if you want to see a friend, you call them. They answer the phone. <laughs> First of all, they answer the phone. <laughs> They'll answer the phone and say, "What are you doing tomorrow?" So, oh, not much. Okay, can can we meet somewhere? Can we come over? And that happens. Here, it's more like, "Oh, let's catch up." Okay, let me look at my schedule. Maybe in the next the next two months. Maybe and this is so weird for us, mm-hmm. for Brazilians. Of course, it's a different uh, yeah, culture. You might even be criticized for calling they'll be like why are you calling why don't you text me and, no i don't call americans yeah, no, no. i'm saying call but i text they'll be annoyed <laughs> they'll actually be annoyed that you're actually trying to call they're like what's what's going on what what, what are they calling yeah. it so you know it's like and, and they've been led down a road you know they didn't just wake yeah. up that morning it's tough they, it's been, tough they were born into that mindset yeah. and you know they're a product of it yeah, yeah. The other day I was even thinking about a word that Americans use a lot that we don't have the equivalent in Portuguese or in, in our culture, hugger. You know, are you a hugger? In Brazil, we don't qualify people who hug. We yeah. just do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the follow-up question is, have you made friends in your 40s? And do you feel similarly to them as you do, for example, towards Bob and, you know, Berto? And... Mm-hmm. Have I made friends in my 40s? 40s um yeah you know, later later in life later yeah. in life um yeah absolutely um and it's not well yeah i mean i don't know what we're not as asking me precisely you know it's like is it possible to make friends when you're older yeah absolutely um i've had a lot of close friends for a long time i've been born and raised i've lived in the same general area my entire life so i'm, I'm yeah. friends with people i went to preschool with you know mm-hmm and still hang out with them frequently. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, it's, I haven't had to completely a new my friend group, at, you know, by moving or something. So it's always been an iterative process and a, and a value system over my life that I've, you know, if, if mm-hmm. I suddenly in my forties had no friends and had to build friends, it, it would have taken me a long time. It, it's hard, you know, but mm-hmm. the key, the one thing I always recommend to people that I still do to this day, even though I consider myself to have a good set of friends, is initiation. I initiate everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, 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 if I thought about it, it kind of hurts my feelings that I have to initiate everything, but I don't think about it. I just, yeah, like, yeah. I know that they want to anyway, you know? Um, yeah. And we've talked about it, I guess. <laughs> and, and so they yeah. just don't initiate people, people in a, the United States yeah. do this. Uh, on in general don't initiate yeah that's a great word initiation and the other one's acceptance i mean if 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 a new person comes along i mean i be acceptant i accept that there might be a a new friendship there yeah Mm -hmm. okay so i want to start the second part kirk by doing an exercise with you let's pretend we've never met well we actually have never met but let's say i'm a stranger we meet on i don't know in a conference or at a bar whatever Mm -hmm. how would you introduce yourself Hey, I'm Kirk. What? I am not comfortable introducing myself as anything other than I'm Kirk. Um, and when people ask hmm. me, what do I do? 
I, well, you know, lately I've been actually answering that question. I will say I'm a YouTuber. Um, hmm. If the, particularly if they're a younger ish person, if they're older, they might not know what that is. So I might say I'm in media or something, mm -hmm. but it's taken me a long time to, because it is more truthful. If I say I'm a therapist, people think that's all I do all day. And I have very, mm. very few clients. Or if I say I'm a professor, it's a similar thing. Because, uh, you know, the past few years, all I, you know, 99% of the work I do is YouTube and the podcast. So to say I'm a, I'm a therapist and a professor, to, you know, very quickly doesn't really summarize it. But some fr sometimes for the sake of ease, I'll just say I'm a therapist because it's the, it leads to the fewest questions. If I say I'm a YouTuber, they're like, uh, huh? About you know, what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you know, so I, I, I guess I'll, I would just say I would, when in doubt, I would say I was a therapist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But honestly, I, I don't like answering that question to strangers because I've been, I don't know, maybe one out of five times, I get pretty weird reactions from people. And maybe hmm. not so much in the recent years, but when I, you know, in the nineties and aughts, when I would say I was a therapist, people get worried around me and paranoid and, or they, really? they'd start insulting the whole industry, you know, cause they've uh, been brainwashed to think that it's like, a, a you know, a, an exploitative science or something. And so, um, uh, back in the day, I would say I worked for Microsoft because one out of every two people in Seattle, particularly back in the day, worked for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And and you never want to have a conversation about someone's Microsoft job. Everyone understands that because it's boring. Mm -hmm. So I would say I work for Microsoft, and no one would no one would follow up with any other question, and I could just move yeah. on with my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the reason why I ask is because I love narrative uh, therapy. Uh, and one of the things that, as you know, <laughs> you teach these things, mm -hmm. narrative talks about the stories that you tell about yourself, right? And yeah, when well, you I introduce- a, I, told, I told a long story about how I don't want to tell stories to people. Yeah, <laughs> but, it, but how much it, it really represents sometimes who you are and what you believe about yourself. So it sounds like you have changed that storyline, you know, throughout the years mm -hmm. for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I were to answer it to someone like you that I knew wouldn't judge me and you were actually wanting me to say more than uh, one word, I would say that I am someone that's trying to make the world a better place through mm. media with the asterisks of it meets a little bit of my narcissistic needs to have mm -hmm. people listen to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love that you talk about that because there is a uh, an image that we have of therapists, the wounded healer, right? And it sounds from what I've heard, you talk about your, your life and your parents and how you were brought up. And you just said you stayed, you pretty much stayed in the same area that you had a very healthy uh, uh, life and childhood. And so that's kind of different. Most, I remember when I went to school and I, everybody because as you know we have to really dig into our lives and talk about it in public in class and there was a lot of wounds there so I, it always made me curious about you I mean what made you want to become a therapist <laughs> yeah I mean I did not have problems I suppose but uh but really I just had one of the best childhoods my parents are having their 60th wedding anniversary this yeah. summer um I'm really good friends with my three siblings and, and their, their, their spouses, um, their kids are great. Um, one of my, you know, one of my brother's kids actually works for the podcast now. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I, I I'm just so fortunate. Um, again, I don't have my, I do have issues, but, but, um, in terms of what led me to be a therapist, I, I mean, it's a long narrative for that, but the highlights would be that I, I grew up, I grew up very Christian and mm -hmm. was um, in a church that from my memory anyway, and I was, I'm pretty sure this is true, was not what a common American Christian is like today in that we were very 70s hippie and free love, you know, love, love your neighbor and mm -hmm. don't judge. And, um, you know, 
don't be angry, don't hurt other people's feelings, be, you know, be charitable, give to others, Mm -hmm. uh, don't be materialistic. You know, Jesus talked about not, you know, it'd be easier for a poor man to enter heaven than a camel through, I don't know, there's there's some sort of a camel and a needle there somewhere. And um, I uh, really, my whole family was into it. My parents, my three siblings, we went to church all the time. We went to different events and there was a lot of sitting in circles talking about our feelings. I remember in um, youth group starting at age 11, 12, uh, it was a lot of fun and a lot of activity. And and I was one of the younger kids in the youth group. So I I looked up to these older people. A lot of my music came from them actually, musical uh, tastes. They were, they were actually cool kids in my church. And, uh, you know, we would sing songs and then we'd spend, and then the youth group leader would talk about some topic. And then we would just talk about our feelings. <laughs> I just remember sitting in our cir- sitting in a circle, just talking about our dreams and our fears and our pains and our suffering and, and loving each other and supporting each other. Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of self-reflection, you know, it was a lot of um, what, I, I continue to do today. And so I think that was a huge seed that was repeatedly mm-hmm. planted mm-hmm. throughout planted. my childhood. Yeah. Um, and also I had friends in high school who we would stay up all night. You know, I would sneak out at night sometimes and I wouldn't use drugs or drink or have sex or anything, I would sit with my friends and we would talk about ph- what we consider to be philosophy. You know, we we're 15, oh, 16 cool. years old and yeah. we didn't know anything about anything, but, um, but that's what I was sneaking out of the house to do, to like talk about life and the meaning of life and about um, emotions and about mm-hmm. where, you know, where we were headed in life and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, in fact, the, one of the people I started the podcast with, Lita, so it was Umberto and me and Lita. Uh, I've known her since preschool, and we were best friends in high school. And we would sneak out at night, and we would write music and poetry and talk about philosophy, and, and yeah. we'd stay up all night long and and go to school the next day uh, real tired, and then we'd sleep on the couch in the drama department. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that was another part of it was just that that need for introspection and deep mm, conversation reflection yeah and and hearing other people's stories uh, mm. i was always interested in knowing other people's stories um mm-hmm. also, were you always a were you always a, a good listener uh yeah i mean on the scale of things i wouldn't say i'm amazing naturally but on the mm-hmm. scale of things i was um I was part of what we called natural helpers in high school, which was a program to train kids to be good listeners, you know, to, to be oh, like cool. peer, peer counselors. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so there was that. I also think in my family, I'm a middle, middle child. And so um, I think I was kind of a hub to everyone because I was mm-hmm. in between my siblings and my parents. And, and so I was um, kind of like that, central person to some extent um i think that that also had an effect um yeah uh but i hadn't had a dream to become a therapist until i was sitting in traffic i had a job post back baccalaureate Mm -hmm. stuck in traffic i was working at a a sort of a a tech business for for ancillary to microsoft and i it I was just like, I don't know if this is what I, I like this job, but I don't know if this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then all of a sudden, boom, it just, it just suddenly occurred to me to be a therapist. And I've never like that. It just, yeah, going to be a therapist. I'd been in therapy when I was 19. Oh, okay. Um, so you had that experience. Okay. Yeah. But I'd never thought about anything even close to being a therapist. You know, I never thought about being a physician or a psychiatrist mm-hmm. or anything. And I'm so happy that it popped in my head because what if some other weird job popped in my yeah. head and I wonder where would I be today? <laughs> you probably would change like I did. I was a journalist for 20 years. <laughs> um, well, that must have helped being a psychologically oriented person as a journalist. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I actually was between the two professions when I chose being a journalist. And I do think that they're so similar. You have to be yeah. a good listener. You have yeah. to see, to read between the lines, right? To ask the right questions, to listen yeah. more than talk. So I think there's so many, so many things that are in common between yeah. being a journalist and a therapist. Yeah, you must have learned a lot as a journalist about how to, um, in you know, encourage people to get into the mindset of, ask answering questions because yeah, you know, not everyone is make them answer. comfortable yeah 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 it's true okay tell me tell me a few experiences or maybe relationships that have shaped you uh Made you who you are yeah relationships that have i mean all my relationships have shaped me I'll or maybe something my, that happened in uh, your life well i'll talk about my wife um mm -hmm. She has her issues too, and I'm a therapist, so I've analyzed her up and down, of course. And I'm, always, <laughs> I'm always right about it. Uh, because, of course. Because I'm the professional. We all understand that. Just joking. Um, but she, I look up to her in a lot of ways. And the way that kind of pops into my head is her, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry again thinking about it, but her ability to forgive without being apologized to if that makes any sense hmm. <laughs> she she you know for a while i was like i think she's a doormat like she doesn't stand up for herself but then as time went on i discovered that she's just so secure that it just doesn't it doesn't bother her you know she hmm. it doesn't get to her she it, it'll bother her briefly but she just very quickly just doesn't think about it it just yeah. she, she doesn't remember like um like if if she were upset at me which mm. would of course happen occasionally and you were to ask her like um well tell me about tell me about his problems like what's wrong with him most of us would be able to and especially in that mood would be able to talk for yeah. a long time about what's wrong with our rent spouse. rent yeah right. we'd be like well let me tell you yeah duh, 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 duh. <laughs> and it and it and, and all those things would have a long-standing thread of gathering data of being hurt or upset or concerned it, it would be a, a long-standing kind of grudge or concern mm -hmm. you had about your partner she doesn't have those things because she doesn't catalog those stuff it, it wow it's just, it, it doesn't stick with her. Um, she, uh, another thing that I look up to her about is that, and this is very contrary to me and, you know, it's pros and cons to this is that. So, so anyway, going back to the first point, I try to be more like her in that way. Like hmm. it, I try to be more like, um, that seems a happier life of, of if yeah. possible, you know, you don't want to be a doormat, but if possible, like, Hey, you have one life to live. Why, yeah, let why go, like, right? Let yeah, go. Yeah, I just like rigidly, you know, it, it it's like I don't know, living in the it's like a Buddhist relationship oriented way or something where just living in the moment, you know. Um another thing about her is that when I make a request to her, you know, it's it'd be like, "Hey, you know, when you did that thing, it kind of bothered me." She doesn't communicate super well. Like she, you know, as a therapist, I've got all the techniques, you know, all the I, tools. <laughs> yeah. I know how to, I know how to validate. I know how to uh -huh. actively listen. Uh -huh. I use I statements, you know, I know, all yeah, the steps. Yeah. you know, I teach it all the time. And so if she were to say something to me, you know, I've, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I know the stuff. When I say to her, she doesn't do any of that stuff. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like not much response, uh, defensive at times. Um, and so on the surface, verbally, it looks like I'm being shut out, but behaviorally, she always delivers like, okay, she, you know, she, it, it, it's, in, it's in the proofs in the pudding. I, you can, you can say you vow, you can say you understand mm. all you want, but if you don't actually change your behavior, if you don't, because yeah. that's the main thing we're looking for is mm -hmm. please consider this in the future when the next time yeah. this comes up, you know, like mm -hmm. that might hurt. Now that you know that hurts my feelings, maybe don't do that in the future or do it differently. And she is 
I've never met anyone like her in that way. Uh -huh. Like she, yeah. she's, she just locks, she's very smart. So she just locks in on a detail uh -huh. and then mm -hmm. it, she won't make that mistake again. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it'll, it's incorporated, you know, yeah. and not, and she's not busted up about it. She, she's just like, oh, okay. You know, but she doesn't indicate it. <laughs> she, yeah. doesn't, she doesn't say duly noted. She, it, yeah. It, and, and how does that shape you? Is that something that you also work? I try to do that too. I try you know, to do I, that. Yeah. yeah I, I try to um, remember and consider, you know, yeah. um, and, and not necessarily talk about it for five hours, which is what I want to do. Because you know, you know she listens and she makes an effort. Yeah. She listens. Yeah. But um, I want to have the back and forth, you know, like, because <laughs> that's, I don't know. But, but really what you're looking for at the in the end is yeah please just change your behavior slightly in the future yeah. in light of what i'm telling you right yeah, now. yeah cool you, know. you use a word that i want to go back to because that's my next question for you you said she's so secure and mm -hmm. the word that you use as we know comes from attachment theory mm -hmm. and i have heard you a few times say that i i have a tendency to be avoidant right mm -hmm. I've heard you say that a few times. So first of all, ex can you explain as a teacher very shortly, what does that even mean? I mean, what is attachment theory? But but just just the avoidant part, mm -hmm. just so they understand what my question is. Yeah, so we have various different styles of reacting to attachment loss and insecurity and fear. And our general way of responding is when we're afraid or hurt, we run toward our attachment figures for comfort. There are obvious examples of children doing this, but we do this throughout our lives. And uh, when we have complications to that, that process of having something that doesn't go well for us and we run to our attachments and our attachment figures don't react uh, with optimal attunement most of the time, then we have to find a way of coping with that. So if we, for example, have one of the uh, examples of lack of attunement optimization is when a parent it doesn't notice and or doesn't react as readily or as um, robustly as the child is looking for. So you have a three-year-old that wants to interact or is afraid or something and signals that to the parent somehow and the parents are busy with their own thing or they're just not even there because they're at work or something and the child in that situation has as a conundrum they're just like well i still have this tremendous need and i'm alone and i, I don't mm -hmm. know what to do with this how do i cope with it because this is painful I, I i feel this thing and i'm i'm reaching out for my secure base and they're not available emotionally or physically and so how do I cope with that? Well, one of the coping styles is what we call avoidance. So the child will learn early in life to just avoid reaching mm -hmm. out. And, yeah. but then that has its, a number of implications in addition to that, which is the easiest way to avoid reaching out and getting rejected or seeing no one there is mm -hmm. to avoid one's own emotions, even though mm -hmm. the emotions are mm -hmm. there. And so you have to neurologically detune yourself from your own emotions yeah and you also have to develop a, 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 a your own secure base you have to find something you can rely on and mm -hmm. some people will resort to themselves because that's all they have mm -hmm. and yeah. we call this narcissism so the person yeah. will say well you know what i don't need other people i'm better mm -hmm. than others and i'm the best and i'm self-sufficient yeah. right yeah pathologically yeah. independent that's what i call it <laughs> and um, so my upbringing was ideal, but if there was something that went slightly wrong, it was in that direction. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, and I always test out as securely attached, but, and I believe everyone has some mm -hmm. tendency yeah. when, when the stuff hits the fan and when the stuff hits my fan, I, I, I avoid and uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I will not even know I'm suffering or yeah. I'll just be like, yeah. screw it. I don't need people. Yeah. And, uh, and I also am pathologically independent. Um, incidentally, my wife is too. 
perhaps uh-huh. even more so to some. <laughs> so we fit kind of well together yeah. in that way. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, uh, but yeah, so so that's what um, mm-hmm. that's how I wonder. Works. I wonder if that's also related to the fact that you're a middle child. Mm-hmm. Well, also the fact I'm one of four. I mean, when you have four kids, mm-hmm. there's only so yeah. much attention that can be distributed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now that you explained, my question is, how does it show up in your relationships? And mm-hmm. are you attuned now that you've studied it, you've taught it, mm-hmm. you're self-aware? How attuned are you to make the changes that are necessary when it happens? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. I've been through a lot of therapy. I've studied it a lot. Mm. I've done a lot of self-reflection. I've talked with my wife a lot. I've experienced things a lot with my wife and other people. And I, uh, one, and this is what I recommend for everyone is to have awareness. So Mm -hmm. I try to, there there will be moments where, um, you know, certain sentences will run through my head and I know to flag those as avoidant Mm -hmm. style. Yeah. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean I don't go go along with it. It just means I'm like, oh, something must be happening with me because I have to triangulate to my needs. I, I, I don't feel them as readily as, uh, say, a preoccupied person would. And so I have to, oh, I must be actually suffering right now. Um, and with a lot of practice, I've, I've learned to uh, get better at that, to connect more readily and more robustly to my suffering and 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 dependence on other people and my my neediness which is my Mm -hmm. vulnerability Mm -hmm. which is of course normal and if i if i go on cruising speed i i won't i won't notice it uh, i'll deny it even though it's happening Mm -hmm. um and so one is awareness and two is healing so the more vulnerable and neediness I express that is received well and is safe and mm-hmm. is reciprocate or is uh, met with nurturing and love and acceptance and compassion, the more I don't need to resort to avoidance because my body just trusts other people with my pain. Me tearing up during this interview is an example of that. You know, 20 years ago, I that wouldn't have happened because mm-hmm. my body didn't trust anyone. Uh, or my, I, I, on average, I trusted people, but in a pinch, mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily trust people. But because I've healed to the extent that I have, my body just naturally feels vulnerability I, I can you know it's it's present in my body mm-hmm. in my mind and my emotions and expresses itself sometimes as tears you know coming mm-hmm. out of my face yeah so uh that's what I've done a lot mm-hmm. like I said lots of therapy literally I'm obsessed with attachment theory so me too it's every, my basis <laughs> every day it's my lens day, I'm thinking about it you know what I mean? yeah. like it's yeah. not something I just sort of sort of like do once a week in therapy it's it's literally all the time because i consider uh-huh. it to be the the central it is thing to focus on to make myself and the people around me happy mm-hmm. yeah but do you do you remember like an example of, of when it crept in and you said wow i'm doing it in a relationship in a situation yeah all the time uh uh was it easy, for example, as a, you know, growing up, was it easy for you to just break up relationships? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, I uh, had a, a significant relationship in high school and I had been very, very vulnerable and it was a lot of pain for me. And after that, and that's actually why I went to therapy when I was 19, because mm. I was noticing that I was so cold to Hmm. people in general I just I felt like I was really I couldn't open up and I I could feel that and I was concerned I had enough uh, uh, non-avoidance I had enough security to know that something was off and I had been injured by the relationship she didn't abuse me or anything it was just you know you're in high school and you fall in love and it's just hard so I went to therapy solely because I mm. thought I, that relationship had kind of broke, you know, had broke something in me. And um, the therapy turned out to be very bad. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, 
he was a very <laughs> psychoanalytic uh, oriented oh. therapist and um he sat behind a desk and just mm. listened to me the whole time and, and didn't even ask questions and at some point i asked him i i said um so i've been talking for 10 weeks are you gonna say anything <laughs> and he's like what would you what do you want me to say uh, and, yeah. the question to yeah. answer a question yeah and so <laughs> to some extent when i decided to become a therapist i was like i think i want to be a different therapist than the one that i yeah am. I totally get you because that was my first training. I did five years in psychoanalysis training and I couldn't be further from that today. <laughs> so I get it. Uh, you're talking about emotions. What are the ones that are hard for you to express? You said that tearing up. So, you know, vulnerability is one that you have worked on. What are the ones that are still hard for you? Hmm. Or are they? I don't know. I don't, I feel like I've, you know, it's been, I'm 52. I've been working on it for a long time. I, I guess I would say if I'm not with someone that I, well, I don't know. Like I, you know, I was at a memorial for my mentor who died recently and I was with a bunch of people that I didn't know that well. And I uh, was one of the few people that talked in front of the crowd and, and completely started to bawl crying and, and didn't feel strange or hmm. or vulnerable or bad or anything so i am anger are you okay with with expressing anger? i love anger <laughs> I, I, I see that on your podcast you're very good at venting <laughs> i'm very i'm very comfortable with anger i i use it all the time <laughs> um i consider it to be a blessing it's a, it's a sign of injustice it's a sign of something's wrong and you know I, I like to use it, you know, it's, I, I, I harness. Anger. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I, there's probably times where it's, uh, it would be better if I were more, you know, I, I guess I'm a little envious of people who can, uh, express vulnerability so easily, you know, mm. I can cry, I can talk about vulnerability, but I don't, I probably don't embody it in a way mm -hmm. that really makes it clear to others mm -hmm. that I'm truly suffering. You know, some people, when they're suffering, it just, boom, you just, you just notice it and it provokes compassion and care yeah. from other people. So maybe that's the next phase of my yeah. emotional yeah. development. Well, I'll talk about one and just an observation from what I've heard you talk about. You just went through a very, very difficult experience with the online bullying. Mm -hmm. And the the emotion that I want you to talk about is fear. Because mm -hmm. from what I heard you, it was a very scary experience. I mean, mm -hmm. you had, I don't know, death threats, but a lot of threats mm -hmm. uh, online because of something that you were not going into it, but something that you you did a lot of episodes on the Johnny Depp trial. And of course, you know how the online world is very divided and they either love you or hate you. There's no in between. <laughs> so a lot of people uh, had horrible things to say about you. And it it sounded to me that it was a very scary and you were really struggling dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was scary. I, How are you doing now? I'm doing great now. I mean, there's still residual, mm. minimal residual fear and pain and hurt from yeah. that time. But I've reached a phase that it is, I, I'm still working on it. And I'm guessing part of it is actually experiential. I, I have to actually have enough time experiencing the internet mm -hmm. in a way that feels safe. I'm still trying to internalize that the internet is a safe place again because it it wasn't. Yeah. And it and so I need I think my body needs to have another year or two where nothing like that happens again for me mm -hmm. to truly mm -hmm. feel comfortable entering into the internet again. Yeah. Um and a you know a big part of that is I'm just never going to do anything like that again. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm not going to, I don't cover, blame you. No, I'm no. not going to cover those kinds of topics. 
uh, I don't care how many views or how much money yeah. I can make. I, it's mm -hmm. it's not worth it to me. No, no. So you you you're better. It, it just it just occurred to me when I listened to you talk. So, wow, maybe fear is one of them that maybe you hadn't experienced before, and you were really struggling on how to well, deal I, with that. I do have, I do have more anxiety probably than the average person. Mm. So. I think if I do have fear, it does plague me more, uh, perhaps mm -hmm. than the average person. It yeah. you know it it tends to get stuck in a loop of rumination and mm -hmm. and concern and suffering for me. But I don't know. I I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of people, you know, yourself maybe be able to talk about this as well. It just it's it's um you get a bad comment and it hurts yeah. and it stays in your brain right yeah even you have if it's 10 you have 10 good ones one bad one you go wow why does it stick right yeah right it's it, the I, rejection it, i think it's the feeling of rejection yeah. yeah and i i've never met another content provider who didn't have a almost identical feeling they all have yeah. their own coping strategies but i think the general wisdom is somehow you know the good content providers or the the confident content providers have thick skin and it doesn't get under their skin uh, i've 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 never met a person yeah. and i've talked to a lot who would say that if they were being truly honest you know now they might not read any comments <laughs> yeah that's a good technique <laughs> yeah uh so when i was going through the trial that was times a thousand and uh it was it was hard, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's overwhelming, I think, uh, for anyone. I, I don't, I don't think I had a particular, uh, I don't think I had a particular reaction to that other than my OCP, my mild OCPD in that I was, my perfectionism was being challenged. And so that, that added an additional kind of tweak in my brain yeah i was yeah. trying to fall asleep at 3 30 yeah. in the morning you know? yeah because when you prepare i i remember one time you were talking about your mild cpd and your 500 pages of notes and i'm going mild <laughs> <laughs> talk about trying to be perfect huh mm -hmm. well <laughs> If I were moderate, I wouldn't even be able to make content because I would be too. Yeah, you'd be stuck. Yeah, yeah. you get so stuck. The yeah. mildness <laughs> motivates me to be very thorough yeah. and to take it a little too much to heart when someone criticizes, or if mm -hmm. I have an editing problem, I I ruminate on it too much. But I I'm not so severe that I am mm -hmm. suffering greatly or. I don't actually make anything, you know. Okay. Well, to end, I want you to tell me a few things that you admire in yourself, mm. in Bob, mm. Berto. Mm. You already talked about Stacy, but in Ovi and Leia. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> those are the dogs for those who don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, things I admire. Admire. In yeah. And in you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'll start with the dogs, I guess. Um, I admire Obi, the big boy dog for being the sweetest boy who yeah. is loving and accepting and tolerant. Uh, Leia, I admire her for being able to express her fears. <laughs> 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 and expressing her dependence, um, you know, she's she's needy and she expresses it. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's able to do that. Uh, Umberto, I res I admire him for uh, being extremely non-reactive. Like an example when um we play video games at night me and mm -hmm. umberto and his brother we play and we it, it, and we get into it you know they're they're pretty intense games if you yeah. if people out in your audience know about real-time strategy games and they're it's pretty intense and, and there's a lot at stake there's a lot of emotions there's a lot of ups and downs you know it's sort of like mm -hmm. if 
your World Cup team loses. Oh, it, don't it say sucks. that to a Brazilian. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> Soccer. It, it, it's devastating. You know, it, 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 you feel and when you we win, just went it, through it, we just went through it. <laughs> I know. So so when we play these games, it, it you know, we're we're the ones playing it and we try to get better at these games and um, we try to work together as a team. And when you fail as a team, because we're all on the same team, we play mm. against others. Yeah. And when, when one of us fails, it is you know, we will, we'll have a meltdown and, um, me and Umberto's brother will have moments where we will have meltdowns where we'll start whining or we'll be like, how come you guys didn't come to my aid when I asked, you know, we'll start, we'll start blaming people <laughs> and, and it, you know, and it's not joking, you know, we're actually having, a you moment. mean it. Yeah. Yeah. And Umberto almost, he, the, his worst is, isn't even close to our average when we have moments <laughs> like that. Um, but it's not just the game. It's just generally speaking, he's very good at rolling with things um, mm -hmm. and uh, seeing the bigger picture of just like, okay, well, you know, I'm uh, not taking things personally and that, that kind of stuff. He, he's very good at that. Um, Bob, I have a, a lot of admiration for in a lot of aspects. Um, one that I have for him is how vulnerable he can be in life um, mm -hmm. and how hard he works at his relationship. You know, he suffers a lot. Mm -hmm. He's in a very frequent state of suffering due to his tremendous yeah, abuse. Trauma. Mm -hmm. And he's been through a lot of therapy and he is well aware of everything, but his perseverance and his love for uh, his wife and, um, but yeah, just his deep vulnerability, his ability to um, lay it all out there and mm -hmm. to not uh, be afraid, you know, and to not shame himself to lead the way. He leads yeah. the way in so many yeah. ways in that in that way. Um, I loved I loved something he said. Yeah, uh, I would die for kindness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so yeah. Bob. Yeah, and he lives that. You know, it's something that he lives. Uh. Who else am I? You? Oh. <laughs> um, me, I admire how prepared hmm. I am for things. <laughs> um, I, what was it? I don't know if I admire that about myself. Um, I admire, yeah, I, well, thorough, like meticulous. Hmm. <laughs> I'm very detail oriented. Um, I like, like dedicated. That. Yeah, dedicated. Yeah, oh, that's that's a different kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, okay. Oh, that's better. That's a better thing. I once I'm once you're in my inner circle, I'm extremely dedicated. Like, mm -hmm. and I get this from my family. Like my family, there's when someone has a birthday or a, a graduation or something. Um, people in my family, there's no question we're all gonna be there. There, there's. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing Brazilians are like that as well, that there's really We're very no, intense. There's no question. You know, you just, mm -hmm. you don't even question it in your head. You don't think like, oh, do I, you know, even if it's really inconvenient, right. It's, it's like, like my mom would be in the hospital or something. You know, I don't think like, oh, well, that's this inconvenient. There's no question. It's just like, I'm there. Of course I'm mm -hmm. there. Yeah. They're always there for me. I, you know, I've been in various bands my entire life and at still at the age of 52, I'll, I'll play in some dirty dive bar in Seattle with my band and my parents who are almost 80, they always they show up. Yeah. <laughs> and my aunts cool. and uncles, but it's, it's all my Japanese side, by the way, uh -huh. and they show and, you know, I know cool. they're not having the best time of their life, but and, you know, they're always there. And, and so I'm always there, you know, uh, mm -hmm. my uh, other co-host, Rebecca had a family tragedy recently, and mm -hmm. I dedicated myself to showing her that I was going to be there um, whenever yeah. she wanted, you know, there, mm -hmm. there was no question. And, um, uh, you know, I got that from my family. So loyalty and commitment. Yeah, because I consider these things to be ceremonial almost like when you show up 
when you mm -hmm. actually show that, and there's no question that you're going to be there, it defines the relationship. You know, it, 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 sh it it's, it's, um, and I'll, you know, I'll cry again, give up, but it, it, it shows it, it, I think it defines for both people in the relationship what the relationship is. Mm -hmm. It's like a mini wedding or something. You know, we have weddings that define yeah. the relationship. And it is a ceremony, if you will, of this is what you mean to me. And, and this is how I want us to be. You know, I mm -hmm. want us to be this sort of when this happens. Like yeah. as, a, as a side example of this, Umberto and I, a few years ago, we we were both going through health problems and we weren't telling each other mm -hmm. and then we told each other and we're like and both of us were yelling at the other person like how come you didn't call me <laughs> i mean yeah. why didn't you tell me and yeah. you know we were both like well i don't know and then we said that's over you we'll never do that again yeah like we made it a rule like if you ever are in the hospital or something i am one of those people that you call even mm -hmm. if there's nothing you need from me, you tell me. Yeah. And then yeah. we started doing that. So, you know, he would go to the hospital and he would text me a picture of him yeah. in the hospital bed and, you know, we'd have a little chat. And so it's stuff like that, you know, like I, I, I think, you know, we, we have one life to live and I want to live that kind of life. Well, speaking of which, I'll end with a phrase from someone we both admire, Irvin Yalom. Mm. Yes. This is actually, as you know, he's very existential and he talks a lot about the fear of death. And one of the things he asks his patients quite often is, if you had to relive your life over and over and over again, how would that make you feel? Great. I would feel like the luckiest person that ever lived to get a chance uh, to live this life over and over and over again. Cool. Thank you, Kirk, for being with me during my celebration and for yeah, for happy, doing well, and for doing episodes. your work. <laughs> How does it feel? How does it feel? I mean, that's a big. Deal. Oh, I can't believe it! It's a lot, huh? and, and they're all except for maybe two. They're all interviews, so yeah, it's it. I'm, I feel very very accomplished, and I I just hope that it's really helping people. Oh wow! It sounds like it. it sounds like yeah. it's it's really helping people. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. And, and let me tell the listeners, okay, as someone who understands that, you know, it seems like a podcast. You just turn on the microphone, you talk for a bit, oh, you post no. it. It is so much work. It's so much effort. You have to get your energy up for every step of the way. You got to reach out. You got to, you have to go Prepare. back and forth with, you have to go back and forth with the guests. Um, you're often not getting paid for any of this time there are times when seemingly no one cares about what you're doing. Uh, there's always something else you, you could be doing like a chore or something else. And because I'm guessing, well, why do you go through all of it? Yeah. Why? Why? Let me I, ask you, why, do you? why? Because um, since what happened to my dad, since then, I just, it just became a mission to me to present, to prevent suicide. It, I want to prevent suicide, and more than that, I want to help those who lost loved ones to deal with the loss mm. and to understand what that is. And these two are really intertwined, and it's hard to separate because mm. when you talk about, for example, we're talking about warning signs and what goes on in their minds. I interview a lot of people who attempted suicide, for example, and one of the things that I do that for is that someone who lost a loved one, they understand what was going on mm. because they're so connected. So that's why I do it. I want to save lives and to help, you know, bring comfort to, to those who lost loved ones. Great. So listeners, if Paula has done that for you, make sure you tell her soon and often because it's the fuel that keeps her going. It's probably one of the only things that, helps her to get the motivation to get through all it's, the bs it's such a it. lonely work isn't it yeah it's so, so tell lonely. her <laughs> soon and often that if that's true that she is doing that mm. for you then let her know thank you Kirk. have a great day you too mm -hmm.